Oh, oh. Thank you, uh, Comrade Vice Chair Lisa. And I would like to express my appreciation to uh, all of you for participating uh, in this school. And uh, I want to send a special shout out per usual uh, to the comrades, sisters and brothers uh, who are on the continent of Africa in particular. There are other places who, where we work where people are also uh, in participating in this discussion today. Uh, but in Africa in particular, I know it's very difficult. In many instances, people will uh, be uh, doing this uh, in in group uh, with group participation because the infrastructure is such that they suck all the resources out, and just in terms of having internet uh, connections and electricity, uh, uh, it's complicated. So I just want to send a shout out there. And I mentioned we saw uh, mentioned here of Sierra Leone. Uh, we thought it was important to be able to show. Uh, that brief uh, video clip of uh, the, the woman who uh, is first lady, if you will, in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. and how she talked about uh, how uh, the, the colonizers continue to control even the elections in Sierra Leone, and, uh, but through controlling all of the resources in Sierra Leone, that all of the mines are owned by foreigners in Sierra Leone, uh, we do work in Sierra Leone. We have uh, we are organized on the ground in Sierra Leone, and part of the things, the projects that we had in Sierra Leone, uh, led by Comrade Director uh, Aisha Fields, who heads the organization on African People's Development Empowerment Project. Uh, part of the the what we were doing is that we there, there is no there is no uh, clean water system there, as you heard uh, the First Lady saying. So uh, what we've done is we organized uh, Africans from other places, including the United States, to go into Sierra Leone. We initiated rainwater harvesting and things like that to be able to try and make it easier for people to have access to, to clean water and also to reconnect uh, African people uh, from from other places, uh, and so that in Sierra Leone and from the U.S. and from other places, people could begin to actually work together to solve the problems of Africa, as opposed to uh, continuing to simply rely uh, on on the same foreigners who are exploiting Africa uh, today. And and also, we did that so that we wouldn't have to rely even on the government. This is interesting because several years ago, uh, after leaving Sierra Leone. Uh, Comrade Deputy Chair, whom some of you met uh, during the meet and greet on yesterday, and some of you know otherwise, uh, we were leaving Sierra Leone, and uh, we were on an airplane. <laughs> and it was an interesting trip, <clears throat> because she sat next to a man who was the vice president of Sierra Leone, and he was fuming. He was extremely upset because... The president uh, was sitting uh, in business class or something like that, and he was stuck back there uh, in regular passengers thing. And he's sitting next to uh, to uh, deputy chair owners in Asia, <laughs> and he's complaining, you know, that having to be back there. She looks at him. She says, "What are you talking about? You say, you see, look out the window. It's night. Look out the window. You can't see a single light." on the ground in Sierra Leone. You guys are running the government and this is the condition that our people have to experience. I mean, she really criticized him and shut him up, uh, by the way. And, uh, and that's what she's now talking about, that the foreigners still own and control the electricity, everything, and we do not have access to it. And if anybody has ever been to Sierra Leone, uh, very beautiful place, and I love Sierra Leone. Uh, uh, and you can go and you can literally see uh, a train that is several miles long. And every day it runs 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day. One way going in to pick up uh, ore from the mines and then uh, one way and then going back to the ship. The way, and this is 24 hours a day, all day. It never stops. And you can't even see the end of the train. And these are resources being taken from there. There is no electric grid in Sierra Leone. So everybody is uh, trying to make it using these uh, gas-powered uh, uh, generators. So that's all you hear all day. Uh, there is no, at night, your children can't study. 
Uh, you talk about education, what have you, there's no lights, there's nothing like that. And that's, that's our Africa that they're strengthening, but it's related to everything that we do here. And it's really important for us to understand this because we're looking at Palestine, but this is a daily kind of process that happens to Africa, African people, and all the colonized peoples of the world. With all of our resources being stolen, uh, we've been locked into this parasitic relationship where Africa and the colonized people, the vast majority of the people on the planet Earth function as a host to this parasite that sucks our blood, sucks our resources, sucks our education, sucks our health system, sucks our freedom, sucks our dignity on a regular ongoing basis, relentlessly, that's what's occurring. That's what we're dealing with. And then, uh, as, as, as she said, uh, and it looks like they were talking about the president there in Sierra Leone having banned political actions. And it seems like she was explaining that, and this is the only part of that uh, video, that an interview that I saw, and she's saying that in Sierra Leone, they own everything. And then if you try to do anything to challenge their authority, they fund your opposition. They put your opposition in motion so that they will kick you out of power. And that's the nicest thing. That's the nicest way they do it. They execute people. They assassinate people. Uh, they do everything. Uh, uh, the France invaded Ivory Coast, uh, uh, overthrew uh, Bagbo. Bagbo was no no revolution or anything like that, but he was in the process of making some kind of economic arrangement with China. And they came in and they overthrew him. It was a humiliating thing. They saw, showed pictures of him sitting on the bed. In his bedroom, the French, these white uh, French uh, troopers, in his bedroom, here's the guy who was the president of the country. And in a very humiliating kind of situation, then what they did, they took him from there, and they took him to where? Well, they, the international uh, uh, court, was it the ICC, International Court, uh, Criminal Court or something like this? They took him to The Hague and put him on trial, put him in jail, took him out of Africa, took him to Europe and put him on trial. And despite the fact that even under law circumstances, he beat the trial and still had him locked up for the longest period of time. This is our reality as colonized people. And that's related to the whole question, because as we will talk throughout this process, elections are happening all over the world right now. It's a very uh, a serious kind of situation, but all of the elections, or most of the elections are happening within this colonial mode of production, within a process that was established by Europe. Europe established the process, what the procedures are, what elections should look like, uh, uh, all of that. They did that to suit their purposes, et cetera. And this is the platform this is the thing that rests upon the platform of our oppression and exploitation. So I just wanted to say that. And I want to thank all of you uh, for being here and participating. I want to uh, really give a special uh, 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 a statement of appreciation to the steering committee uh, of the Black and Black Coalition Social Justice, Peace and Reparations. And uh, when we talked about the steering committee just a moment ago, we did it in a way that I felt like didn't really recognize the totality of the steering committee appropriately, just because we talked about the coordinating committee, uh, which is that component that has responsibility for carrying out the will of the steering committee on a daily basis, more or less, uh, as do with the money, the, 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 the uh, general uh, uh, mission, practical work that has to be done, has to do with the, the working groups uh, that are supposed to be regularly doing the work. Uh, 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 you're talking about the coordinating committee, but the coordinating committees are part of the steering committee. And the steering committee is comprised of uh, the leaders of the various organizations who are part of uh, the coalition uh, and the coordinating committee. So that's that's the way that is. It's not like a steering committee and a working uh, and a uh, coordinating committee that's that's separate in the fashion that 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 uh, is uh, you know like rigid in that fashion in that way. So what I have to do is uh, is provide like a, a opening statement overview and. Uh, and I'm going to do that by uh, by reading to you the um, the uh, call that was written uh, for this school. 
And I'll say some things in the process of talking about the call. Uh, 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 and I want to do this also uh, recognizing that, and I think it's extremely important, uh, because the United States government uh, has attacked uh, our revolutionary movement, and, uh, and they've attacked the movement of the indigenous people some time ago. They it disguised the fact that they attacking the indigenous people when they lock up Leonard Peltier. And he's not just some guy that they picked up. He's not just some so-called Indian or indigenous person. This is the war that's been going on since uh, interlopers, people uh, who uh, came uh, from Europe. These white people came from Europe, just like the first lady in Sierra Leone was talking about how these white people came there and they still control the economy and everything. This, this is their land. And so they got him locked up and we cannot allow that to be obscured. Right, this is an indigenous person who was on this land where the indigenous people live forever until the white man got here. That's just an objective truth. And I'm saying the white man because uh, what we know is that's the same thing as saying the colonizer. There was no such thing as the white man before colonialism. Colonialism is what created the white man, uh, created Europe and the rest of that. But anyway, uh, we have uh, 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 this, this uh, situation that's before us now, and, and, and we want to uh, just go ahead and say a few things about, uh, about this process, this, this election and the elections that are happening every, everywhere around, uh, around the world today. And we were saying that's indicative, the thing that we just showed uh, about the first lady uh, from, um, from Sierra Leone. So, uh, and, and, and I wanted to mention the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee because it, it truly, um, and I'm, I'm saying this in my humble opinion, with all due respect uh, to uh, people who are here, people who are from Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I truly do not know if SNCC members have recognized the historic role that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee played in changing the world and change. And when, you, when I say the world, I'm talking about, when you look at the United States, you change the United States, you impact on what's happening in the whole world because the United States is the big hegemon. It is the thing that has run the world for the longest period of time. And uh, almost everything that we are talking about, uh, uh, they're charging me, uh, uh, with uh, somehow working for Russians uh, because I uh, came out against what they are doing uh, in Ukraine. And I say they, I'm talking about the United States as, it, as, the, as the big dog, as the one who's leading that process that's responsible for all kinds of Russians and Ukrainians dying as a part of their project. And part of what you should understand is that SNCC, uh, uh, we're looking at Palestine, what's happened, the murder of Palestinians, SNCC. When it came to Vietnam, the opposition to Vietnam, people know Martin Luther King came out against it uh, in April 7th, uh, 1960, uh, April 4th, 1967, SNCC comes out against that war at least a year earlier, at least before that, it was SNCC. Hell no, we won't go. It was SNCC who actually fought, actually got him in fist battles uh, in recruiting stations uh, with people who were trying to bring or uh, 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 recruit Africans into the military force. SNCC did that. It was SNCC. And uh, when I say this, I recognize, as you must recognize, because it's extremely important, SNCC was not, it was it was incredibly significant. It was that bridge between the civil rights movement and the black liberation movement. Uh, and it was comprised of extraordinary human beings. It didn't mean that it was united on every question because it wasn't. There were factions of SNCC. There were people who were engaged in struggles with SNCC. These were dynamic people who were opinionated people, generally speaking who were interested in changing the world. These were not, these people, and there were struggles happening within SNCC, but there was on a common strategical trajectory, whether they were perceiving it that way or not, because you don't do that. When you, in the organization, what you do is perceive your position as the most, posi uh, most important position and struggles happening on, that, on those terms. But SNCC has, has been the crucial force 
Snick gave you, I mean, uh, well, there's so much that we could say about that. But, uh, but the thing is that the United States government will somehow say that the Russians uh, are responsible for the fact what Snick did and the reason you know so don't know enough about it because Snick broke with the trend that had been created by the civil rights movement. Uh, and, and, and today, while people love Martin Luther King, I'm talking about the white people, et cetera, they didn't love him that much at the critical moments in history, even in the 1960s right. and, 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 and 50s, et cetera, because they disrupted the peace. And, but, but King was preferable to the black power position that came out. In fact, they would elevate King as opposed to black power. Uh, it's not that they loved King that much, uh, and they didn't know King either. Uh, people who lived in, who lived and worked with King had some understanding. They don't they don't know us the way they think they know us. But but anyway, that's another story. But SNCC was such a critical thing, and I want to say that that's one reason I think it's really important that comrades uh, feel and comrade uh, Mukasa Willow Ricks. Uh, we call him Rim Ricks. <laughs> he earned it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I was talking to them yesterday. Uh, that's when I say them. I mean Comrade Afia and Mikasa. Um, uh, Comrade Afia played a big role in the radio station that we got there in Florida. She's got a radio station in South Carolina. She said, this is what you do. This is how you go through it. This is what you got to deal with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come out of fear. And, but it didn't just start there. It started with people like Alpha Minor. It started with SNCC. You know, this is the relationship. And, and even this school that we're doing now, SNCC established a process, especially, uh, uh, but not only, but especially uh, with the Vine City Project in Atlanta, Georgia. But SNCC was in, in, in earlier than that, 1960s have decided that they were going to be doing particular work in these cities. This was becoming a strategy for a component of SNCC. Like I said, there were different sectors in, 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 um, in SNCC and factions, uh, but some had decided that this was the process, organizing black people in some of these cities, et cetera, on the ground and fighting for electoral power right there in those cities. That was something that SNCC had initiated. And this had an amazing effect on me uh, in terms of the work that I did. I organized the first uh, 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 SNCC chapter, if you will, on, on the ground, being influenced by what SNCC was doing and, and taking that and developing that when Mikasa Ricks came to St. Petersburg, Florida in 1966, by the way, because we talk about Lowndes County, Lowndes County, uh, 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 Alabama, where the Lowndes County Freedom Organization had organized, uh, uh, well, SNCC had organized the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. And uh, in, in Alabama, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, different parties, or the parties had the, the symbols in the Lowndes County, uh, the, the, the Alabama white people's Democratic Party had the, 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 the symbol, the symbol was a, a white rooster. And SNCC picked this incredible symbol, the Black Panther. That's where the Black Panther comes from. You must be aware of that. You look at the Black Panther Party, SNCC is the father of the Black Panther Party. And when Mukasa came to St. Petersburg, Florida, after I had been arrested for a SNCC tactic, then characterized one of the first, first direct action, black power things that happened, I snatched that mural down. Mukasa was sent into St. Petersburg. He rose into St. Petersburg and destroyed his mama's car. <laughs> Blew up the engine to get him to St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> when he wow. rose in the same, that's what I loved about Snick, too. I love that about Snick. When he rolled into St. Petersburg, Florida, and he came to our office, what was that office? What was that office? Well, this was Snick. 
And that, and the, on the big, right on, on the big painted on, on the on the on the on the, on the, on the building of the wall was a uh, what Black Panther. But this is uh, the Black Panther probably was there. But this is a different kind of Panther. This Panther. <laughs> And it, <laughs> so this was a different kind of panther, but it, the panther was there. And when we marched on the city, when I had torn that mural down, we had marched from the panther office. Uh, and this was uh, December 29th, 1966. Snatched the mural down. March, I think it was third, uh, something like that. Black Panther had a demonstration at the state capitol in California. And they went had a demonstration with guns. We were imitating, following each other, providing all, this is how we, we were learning for a while from each other through the white people's media. Then they got hip to it and stopped, stopped printing about it. But this is the kind of thing that happened and, and this was SNCC influence. And I just want to say that. It's really important because they want to put me in jail and I want to say, come in the field, you're responsible for this shit. <laughs> and, 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 and coming up, this is what SNCC, SNCC did these things. And it was really important for us to really recognize that. They can't kill that. And they would destroy that if they would by saying Black people don't have agency. It's, we take some white people somewhere in the world have to make this stuff happen. And I'm saying that this was come generic to the struggle of African people, not just here, but globally. We've been always, always, always fought for our freedom and so have all oppressed peoples around the world. We have never simply laid down and allowed them to trample our lives and our future. People have always fought back. We are no different from the rest of the people. So I just want to say that. So on April 13 and 14, 2024, the Black is Black Coalition, this was the call. For social justice, peace, and reparations will conduct our eighth electoral candidate school. You must be there. This is the eighth one. And the coalition was pulled together in part as an initiative by the African People's Socialist Party because the government had destroyed the, the revolutionary struggle against colonialism. African uh, movement had been dispersed. People were doing work, but in different places, but there was no to what end that was associated with it. That, and so people were doing busy as hell, doing work, et cetera, but it had no coherence. And so we felt like we're pulling together a coalition of all of the organizations we could that particularly they believed in self-determination, which is anti-colonialism, but began to give coherence. Our movement regains coherence because at least in the 1960s, we know what we fight for, black power. Before that, uh, I was in Watts when it went up. And the slogan was, burn, baby, burn. That came from a disc jockey that was in Los Angeles. Burn, baby, burn. He didn't even talking about burning down cities at the time. He was, that was just a rap. Burn, baby, burn, et cetera. And then, of course, it meant something different when Los Angeles went up in flames. But burn, baby, burn, that doesn't tell you too much. Well, it does tell you a lot. But, uh, uh, but black power. When people started struggling all around the country, they're going, black power, black power. But when they attacked the revolutionary movement, when they destroyed our revolutionary leaders, assassinated people, jailed people, massive arrests, you don't even, can't even imagine the number of people went to jail. And, 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 the, and the vanguard was the first ones who went, Leotis Johnson. Remember, I remember Leotis Johnson out of Houston, Texas, 15 years for a frame up of having a joint of marijuana. How many? John. Yeah. yeah. Two joints. Yeah. John. Yeah. Yeah. And then. 32 years. Yeah. And this is what we talk. Yeah. Because he was black when I was leading the yeah. Texas Southern Gap. Yeah. Yeah. He was in Jet Magazine. They had a black power movement on the campus. And they took a picture in Jet Magazine. He had a bullhorn. And a white teacher walked up to him. And he had the bullhorn up like that. And she was falling back. And they had to had the uh picture of Jet Magazine and the police went on that camp the Black Power Movement and shot up to Jones Hall and shot and uh put hundreds of bullets in it. Two police got killed because the bullets were hitting brick walls like that, bouncing back, hitting them, and they charged the students with murder 
they called the police, they killed themselves, and uh, Leo Johnson was supposed to be the leader, and they put him in jail for a joint of marijuana yeah. and gave him 32 years in prison yeah. and destroyed him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now That's what we're talking about. That's what this is the discussion that needs to happen here. That's what I want to say. That was That's sure what I want to say. They, they want, and they they said that what we also did was we ran for office in 2017 and 2019, demanding reparations and other things like that. And the Russians got us to do that. That's what they said. But nobody paid the price. No, nobody in this country. Nobody in what they now call America paid a higher price for voting than black people did. And it is we, African people, that democratize this society to the extent that there's such a thing called universal suffrage in America today. Black people did that. People whose names many of us will never know. I mean, and, and that's responsible. And they're going to say the Russians got us to do this. I don't know, uh, as I've said before, I don't know any Russians who could teach us how to deal with high-powered water hoses well, when your children are trying to vote or bombing your children in the churches and stuff. No, Russians can't teach us anything about that. We could teach the Russians and everybody how to fight for the democratic rights. But they would deny us our history uh, by saying that somehow we were created, first of all, by the white man, period. Uh, and, and the colonizer, and then uh, when we break free from the colonizer, well, there's somebody else now owns them. The Russians own them now, you know? So this is the nonsense. Well, we're gonna talk about the kind of stuff that Mikasa and Afia can bring to this discussion. I think is extremely important. Um, this is part of the, they say, I'm supposed to go to trial on September 3rd. I'm telling them the trial has already begun. And this is part of it right now. And this is the evidence right now. Leonis Johnson is a part of the evidence. Fatty Lou Hamer and Ella Baker, part of the evidence. And all those people who they bombed in Birmingham, the churches, the killed, that's part of the evidence. Paul Rose, yeah, go back forever. But I think it's really important for everybody to understand that because you read certain things in history and it's just stuff on paper. Or you see something uh, sanitized. The eyes on the prize, that's just something there. But to hear, uh, uh, to really understand how history was made, how history was made, I think that's important. So anyway, am I very bad off? I think we're going to, I can, we can work it out. We'll fix it. We'll fix it. We'll make it happen within the time. That's people doing like this, you know, <laughs> at least they're not doing like this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we explain the need for the Black is Black Electoral School uh, with these words in 2022, and I'm quoting, the sectors of the ruling class and their ruling parties arrogantly assume that the electoral future of the people is in their hands. We know different. This is why the Black is Bad Coalition decided several years ago to provide leadership for our people who engage in electoral politics. This uh, allows the people uh, to advance our struggle against the entire colonial capitalist system uh, while electoral politics are still an option. We will teach ordinary African people, workers, activists, women, and youth how to run for office. The Black is Back Electoral School will also address the age old question of whether or not there are any legitimate gains to be won by Africans participating in elections in a colonial capitalist system. In 2016, the Black is Black Coalition laid the foundation for participating for participation in any election by initiating a successful year-long popular process to create a national Black political agenda for self-determination as a general guide to political work throughout the United States. We we held we held uh, conventions in ten or eleven states uh, over a year-long period in the United States where this national black political agenda was forged. And then we had uh, a, a pre-convention conference in Philadelphia, uh, a national pre-convention conference in Philadelphia, and then finally a national convention in Washington, DC uh, for this political, uh, this national political agenda for self-determination. Not just something we sat in, in a corner and did it, but we took it throughout the country to African people. 
In April of 2017, we held our first electoral campaign school in St. Petersburg, Florida, attended by Africans from several states within the United States. In addition uh, to teaching African people the steps uh, for running for office, we were intent on arming, arming activists with a platform for self-determination as the basis for their electoral campaign. And I wanna make this point because I think it's extremely important because uh, first of all, African people were not supposed to participate in election in this country. I really appreciate a decision by the Supreme Court in 1857 that was uh, a, right here, came, a case right here in St. Louis called the Dred Scott uh, decision, where it was quite clear, they made it quite clear that black man had no rights, the white man had to respect. This was from a, a justice of the Supreme Court. This is not just some angry cracker. I mean, he might have been an angry cracker, but he was a member, he was a part of the, this was a ruling from the Supreme Court. And this ruling was not overturned uh, through some legal uh, process that we were involved in a civil war. It was only 1865 that African people were at least uh, uh, formally uh, declared to be uh, a free people. It was the so-called Emancipation Proclamation. Well, so the voting thing was not established for us. And uh, uh, so, so the coalition has seized custody of an electoral process that has historically been separated from and used against our people and our struggle. Uh, we now have a tool that can be used to positively affect the lives of our community. And this is important because this is what uh, uh, Mikasa and Afia and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and, and those children who were killed uh, in Birmingham, this is what they were up against. They were up against the electoral process was not for us. This was elections, nothing but a nonviolent contest between sectors of contending sectors of the ruling class for control of the state. You know what the state is, don't you? The state is that, that, that apparatus that, that, uh, the, 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 that, uh, uh, that controls the military, uh, the army, the court system. All of this is, this is state power. They don't want you to fight for state power. They want you to fight to make the white man like you against racism, right? So you're fighting against racism, racism, and you don't even, how can you tell when you won? They say, well, Black Lives Matter. Oh, with victory. And, and white people actually, there are millions of white people actually concluded that they, they had overcome what they call a racism because they voted for Obama. Mm -hmm. Truly, this was a great thing that they had done. Look who's coming for them. So, uh, The 19 passed of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, and uh, which was which was incredible, uh, because the Voting Rights Act, because you don't, they, they they neutralize our history. They take it away from us, and you just see that somehow there was a 1964. A civil rights bill that was passed and then 1965 voting rights act they don't tell you about the bloodshed there's nothing in that you when they tell they don't tell about the bloodshed they don't tell about the children uh, who were killed and brutalized etc terrorized i live with terror most of my life and must the true of most black people whether they are conscious of it or not you get it's ubiquitous it's with you all the time anytime you ask even the most uh, erudite and, and well-educated and highfalutin Negro what happens when he's driving and he sees that little bubblegum machine in the, in the rear view mirror. He sees that cop's car thing going on. It's terror that we live with on a regular basis, but it's so ordinary that you no longer call it terror. Just call it the white man. <laughs> well, you don't even call it that sometimes, you know, but, but this is something that we live with all the time. I can't go to that meeting because if my boss finds out, I'm gonna lose my job. I can't be a social, I can't wear my hair like this because if I wear my hair like this, I can't get a job. Uh, uh, this is the reality that we live with all the time, but it's normal. So you don't call normalcy terror. It's just normal, you just wake up and you do things that you do to live, but we live with this on a regular basis. It has all kinds of implications in our lives, health-wise, 
all kinds of implications in our, in our lives to live like this as subjugated into our people. So anyway, since the adoption of the Black is Black 19 point political agenda in 2016, uh, this agenda has influenced the platform of several political candidates. The electoral school, and I wanted to acknowledge the presence also in this, in this meeting today of uh, two heroic figures from St. Louis, uh, 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 Comrade Zaki uh, Baruti, who uh, has been working on the ground here uh, for uh, 30, 40 years, you know, uh, almost, uh, doing incredible work. And then uh, Comrade uh, Jesse Todd, uh, uh, who is the people's alder person who became an alder, alderman here uh, in the 18th Ward, uh, who worked uh, in the electoral system for years and years and years. But before that, he was staying to even Nation of Islam, the uh, various iterations of the Black Panther Party uh, uh, forces here, uh, just being doing political work. And I just wanted to acknowledge these comrades because they're right here in the loop. And uh, Zaki, uh, when we first tried to come to St. Louis, and we weren't, we didn't know anybody in St. Louis when this Mike Brown uh, got killed, but when we, but, but before Jesse got in, the Jackal, with Jesse Jackal and, and Al Charlton, before they got here uh, and was able to subdue the situation, we heard them on Canfield Drive, they, the people were chanting, kill the police. The last time I heard that was 1960. They said a little different, off the pig. I said, damn, pack up and get to St. Louis and, and uh, tried to get to St. Louis, tried to find somebody who we could contact and uh, the one group that was pretty prominent here, uh, they didn't want us to come in. We talked to Zaki uh, and, and uh, geez, come on in. And, uh, and the other thing, of course, the Burningsville newspaper, we went through our, our subscription thing, found somebody in St. Louis uh, who was there. And they, they put us up and, and introduced us to Zaki. And I just wanted to say uh, that was really important. Then when we got here, uh, we attending uh, these board meetings. And uh, because the government here, the ruling class here has been working uh, to change the demographic of St. Louis for a long, long time. And uh, among the things that they were doing was changing, there were 28 uh, wards here and all the persons for every ward. Uh, and what they were doing was reducing the wards to 14 hat in half. Uh, which meant, of course, and, and making them much larger wards, which meant it's going to be harder for people to raise money uh, to cover the territory and then create a further distance between the people and who's supposed to be working for them. Of course, the Negroes who were in power were so corrupt and Black people, generally speaking, said, who gives a damn about them? So it was hard to organize. But when we came to this board meeting and we saw this guy uh, who was, they had to almost physically restrain him uh, in the board meeting, he's arguing at them, and he's part of the Democratic Party, uh, uh, and he's fighting like hell. And we said, who is that guy? And someone said, that's Jesse Todd. And then when all of the, the Negro, all the Negro politicians who were in office, they saw us talking to Jesse Todd. You can see, uh, you can imagine a sphincter clenching move, a, mo a moment, you know, for most of them. And they, they, and they would tell us, don't talk to that guy. You can't trust him. And it, and it was true. He couldn't trust Jesse if he were a crook. Because <laughs> Jesse refused to participate, you know, uh, in the process. Anyway, I've been alerted that I, I should stop now. Uh, uh, but there's, um, but I'm, I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to rush. That's what I'm going to do. It, can I rush? Will I, will I be in terrible violation if I rush? Keep going. Keep going. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the electoral process, uh, school was necessitated after the U.S. government successfully neutralized the blood drenched the victory of our people that resulted in passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act for the first time since post slavery reconstruction, legalized universal suffrage or the right to vote for everyone. However, as we were to learn, this was a hollow victory. The 1965 Voting Rights, Voting Rights Act was passed in the same year as the U.S. government's assassination of Malcolm X. Same year. Uh, this February 21st, 1965, they, they killed Malcolm uh, and presented an anti, uh, and because uh, Malcolm X had presented an anti-colonial 
a political program for African people during the 1964 presidential election campaign that was exemplified by two eloquent speeches with the title, The Ballot or the Bullet. And I think it's really important to recognize this, that Malcolm had just broken uh, with the Nation of Islam. Uh, that was primarily religious-based uh, kind of organization that had, and, 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 and I don't want to undermine the significance, uh, uh, historical significance of the nation, because it's really powerful, uh, do for self. Uh, and the con even the concept of nation, as opposed to being a part of their thing, this is our own nation. We disagree with some aspects of that. The nation of Islam had a powerful impact. But Malcolm had just broken, but the criticism that Malcolm and others were running into said, you guys talk all of this stuff, but what do you do? This is one of the criticism, and that you will uh, you will protect the Muslims, but what about the rest of us? This is another criticism that Malcolm was faced with and uh, also. But at the same time, Malcolm made this move. Martin Luther King uh, and Malcolm X, but Malcolm helped to influence SNCC and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, you had Martin Luther King, uh, who is now breaking from uh, the traditions of the civil rights movement. He had already done that. He's following SNCC now uh, around Vietnam. He's following SNCC, uh, 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 and even he, for a long time, he would not be opposed, would not openly oppose the Black Power slogan. For a long time, he couldn't get King uh, to do that, as hard as they would try and things like that. Uh, so, but, and now King uh, is uh, now engaging in direct action. He's calling on people from everywhere to come in, come into Washington, D.C. They're going to do this, uh, this Poor People's Campaign, a direct action campaign that was going to, uh, as opposed to simply looking for uh, the Democratic Party, et cetera, they were going to disrupt the entire process. That's what King was calling for. Uh, and so Malcolm's uh, uh, program uh, uh, advanced what he called a philosophy of black nationalism that would use the electoral process to unite African people across ideological lines to take over political and economic control of our own communities. And Martin Luther King, uh, May 1966, uh, SNCC also formally advanced uh, uh, the black uh, power slogan uh, demand. Uh, and um, Martin Luther King, I say May, I'm talking now formally, uh, this happened uh, uh, on that march against uh, fear. And Meredith completed the memory. That was not me? It was popularized. Pop, that's what I mean, formally, yeah. It was raised, it was raised um, in the end of 65 and, and uh, formally introduced in the position paper that ran a project position paper in uh February of 66. Was it but it wasn't adopted by SNCC then was it? No. No, that's that's the point that I was making. Yeah. SNCC adopted later on. And uh, uh Dr. Martin Luther King uh and I'm mentioning this this process. There's something is happening. That's all I'm saying. There's something is happening now that's challenging the trajectory from the civil rights movement. It's moving from just civil rights movement. Now people are having to consider the question of power, but not only they're not doing this in a vacuum, because you can't do this, and that's why even this discussion around Palestine, discussion around Vietnam, all of this fit within the general context of the of the struggle against colonialism. So people are telling us to fight against racism. The Vietnamese were saying something else. The Palestinians were saying something else. Other people who were fighting for their liberation were saying something else. And we saw it was impossible for us to ignore the relationship that the struggle of black people here had with the struggle of other peoples in Africa and, 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 and various other places against colonialism, right? And uh, so Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was moving beyond simply, uh, uh, you know, uh, going with the uh, Democratic Party and was calling on the masses to participate in a different way. So during the same period, uh, you know, we're talking about SNCC was in Lowndes County, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, organizing what came to be the Black Panther Force, characterized the Black Panther Party. Uh, and in that process, there were people uh, um, and then and in, in Atlanta that helped to work even on the uh, the Vine City paper, uh, uh, people like uh, uh, this comment who's in Boston now, who's a professor in Boston, yeah. Askia Touré, you know, uh, part of RAM. I mean, you had all these forces who were in motion. They were moving beyond this whole tradition of simply integrating into 
the American system saying that we have to have our own system. Have to have power, black power, uh, et cetera. And you know, I've I've learned subsequent to that that uh, during that march, even uh, uh, the Meredith march, where James Meredith is going to show that you don't have to be scared of white people, that you could march, you know, uh, you know. Uh, and he started this march, and he got about thirty feet, and white man popped up and shot him with a shotgun, uh, and then, which in many ways sort of resuscitated the movement. Uh, because that's when uh, folk went in, uh, uh, met with Meredith, and came in and decided to complete that march, right? And that's where, that's where you saw this whole interesting kind of struggle uh, happen in, in, in Mukasa uh, harassing uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and, and, uh, and King being reintroduced to the community in a different level now uh, and during that march. Uh, and so it was just a remarkable kind of period. But anyway, I'm just going to jump ahead now. So when uh, then, you know, the U.S. government, they kill, uh, they, they uh, uh, attack uh, the office. They kill Fred Hampton in 1969. Uh, 1969, that's the same year uh, that the, they attacked the uh the, the Black Panther Party with the, the, the charges of conspiracy, which they've charged me with. Uh, uh, and and uh, 21 members of the Black Panther Party. That's what gave made uh, Tupac's mama famous because she was something like eight months pregnant. There were 21 of them. They had more than 100 charges of conspiracy against them. Uh, most of the lawyers uh, that they usually relied on tied up in other cases and stuff like that and the remarkable of Fanny Shakur. She, yeah, she pro se, she, 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 she acted as their own lawyer <laughs> and beat them up. And, and they, they, after more than two years being locked up, uh, they were found innocent on all of the charges and uh, precisely, uh, uh, particularly because of the, the work that uh, Fanny Shakur did in that case. So, uh, so we're talking about a period of time that, uh, and, and I want to make the, a point I would make is because America brags around the world about how there's an absence of political violence. They've always said there are no other countries getting political violence, but bombing that church was political violence. Yes. And assassinating King and Malcolm and all these people went to jail. Uh, that was political violence. How in the hell are you talking no political violence? Because it wasn't happening to white people. Right. It wasn't happening within the electoral process. It was just wiping us out. That was political violence that we were looking at. So uh, uh, we said this was the colonial war. Uh, that gives line to the off-proclaimed absence of political violence in the United States that has been a convenient propaganda contrivance used by the United States as evidence of its superior electoral process. Uh, we could now vote. We could vote now. <laughs> but they killed uh, Malcolm. They killed King. They uh, made a major assault on the Black Panther Party. So the programs that we had were independent uh, they got all of our organizers, many of them locked up in jail, underground, running for their lives and what have you. So they say, now, nah, niggas, you can vote. Kill Mega Evers. Kill Mega Evers, yeah. They kill Mega and say, you can vote. Uh, but you ain't got nothing to vote for. They kill the leaders that you might be voting for. So the only thing you got now is Joe Biden's organization, which was also George Wallace's organization, uh, you know, for a long period of time, uh, uh, et cetera. So this is what, what, what demoralized African people around the entire voting process and the electoral process. And I just want to say that uh, it, a, a serious, it's a serious issue because what they did was they pushed us out of this electoral process so that our programs, our issues, our initiative disappeared us, which is absolutely necessary for the colonizers. The colonizers cannot admit the existence of the colonized. And so they disappeared us. We don't exist anymore. We don't have any issues except appendages of the interest of white people, white power, as represented by the Democratic Party mostly. And uh, so the electoral process is the means by which uh, that people who are actually engaged in pursuing their political interests uh, are usually uh, functioning. And, uh, and the majority, many of the African people, there are 100 million people in this country who don't vote. 
who don't participate in the electoral process. <laughs> and because uh, uh, they can't find anything there. They, they, they've done polls and asked people why you don't vote and what for. And, and this, because there's nothing about gentrification in my community on there. There's nothing about police murder in my community. There's nothing about all these black people in prison. That's never on the ballot. You don't have a Democratic Party candidate or any of the candidates for that matter. You haven't even heard it from the Green Party and other, other entities. We've raised that and we've pushed the Green Party and other kinds of stuff to have to finally say something about it, but they don't do it. Even the white left organization, the peace movement, the anti-imperialist, they don't have on their, uh, the fact that they're stealing our babies on a regular basis in a legal process that they call children, probably the child protective services and stuff like that. They steal our babies. That's not only a political agenda. Nobody's talking about that. They disappear, all of those issues, et cetera. And so what we've done with this process is to bring these political issues that's critical to us back into the arena. And uh, the Palestinians have forced them to have to deal with Palestine. They forced them to have to deal with Palestine. Nobody voluntarily did that. The Palestinians forced them to have to deal with Palestine. And uh, the thing is that uh, we have to force our issues on the public agenda. We have to use whatever mechanism to do that. And then I'm saying one thing we do with it, we go back into the electoral arena, but now we're going with Malcolm's program. We're going with the program that King tried to take into it. We go with the program the Black Panther Party tried to take into it. Go to SNCC's program, back into the electoral arena. Especially at this critical moment when everybody uh, has come to conclusion, not just Africans, um, that the electoral process is not working for them. That the Democratic Party, Republican, not working for them. We're saying there is an alternative. People have been trapped into this matrix. But there appears not to be an alternative. You're not for the Democratic Party, it means you're for Trump. You understand? So there see, it appears that we said there is an alternative. There always has been an alternative, and they've killed us and jailed us to make sure that we cannot take to masses of people what the alternative is. It's self-determination, self-reliance, anti-colonialism that's expressing the absolute interest and aspiration of African people to consult in, in unity with the oppressed peoples of the world. Anyway, that's what this is about, and I've talked too long. Uh -huh. yeah, so I'll 